Hello and welcome to our program today. We trust you're keeping well. We're going to commence this program by singing together the hymn, Would You Be Free From Your Burden of Sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or, or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. ask the Lord to bless this program today. Heavenly Father, we thank thee that we can come into thy presence through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We thank thee, Lord, for these programs. We thank thee, Lord, for this ministry where the gospel can be reached to the nursing homes abroad. And, O oh God, we just simply ask and we look to thee, Lord, to bless all aspects of this program. We look to thee, Lord, to bless in the hymn singing, in the prayer times, in the Bible readings, and in the preaching of thy word. We pray that, Lord, thy blessing would be upon this program, and we pray that, Lord, wherever this program will reach, that, Lord, thy presence would be there, and that, Lord, I'd speak to hearts and speak to, speak to souls of their need to be saved. So, Lord, we pray that, Lord, thou'd draw graciously near to the nursing homes. Bless them, we pray, and draw near. In Jesus' name, amen. We're glad to have James Gilly He'll be given a. He'll be singing for us today, and uh, just after James Gilly will be singing, we're going to have the Bible reading from Grace McClung.
from Matthew chapter 6 verses 1 to 13. Take heed that you do not do your alms before men to be seen of them, otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall award thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, Pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. But not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I do want to thank Grace for reading the word of God to us, and also Christopher for leading the meeting. And uh, we're going to come to God's word now, to that portion of scripture that was read, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. And... I want to draw your attention to some of these uh, verses that the Saviour spoke uh, on the Sermon on the Mount. This was early in his ministry. He'd only begun his earthly ministry, and he was on a mountain in Galilee, 
And the crowds came to him, as it was the case in those early days in his ministry when there were large crowds that followed him. And as they came up onto the mountain and sat down, the Saviour began to teach them. And you have that sermon in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, chapter 6, and also chapter 7. And we want to look today at some of these uh, words in chapter 6. It's to do with the Lord's Prayer, as it's more commonly known. Uh, the Lord Jesus himself didn't pray this prayer because it's asking for forgiveness of sin and he did not have any sin that needed forgiveness. But he gave it as a pattern for you and I to pray. It's a pattern prayer for us. And that was the purpose of its teaching because he tells us here, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet and when thou shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your heavenly Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore pray ye. So the Saviour was giving this as a pattern for us to follow. And I want us to think about part of this, the opening part of it, we don't have time today to think about it all, uh, petition by petition, but we certainly are going to start here at the beginning and think a little bit about this wonderful prayer, this pattern prayer that has been given to us, that we might pray along these lines. Uh, some people may take the words themselves and pray the actual words here, and nothing wrong with that as long as it doesn't descend into vain repetition, the very thing that the Saviour warned against here in the, the, the words prior to uh, giving this pattern prayer. So we need to be careful that it doesn't just become uh, a ritual, that we utter the words and we don't mean them. We, we learn them off. We know them so well. We know what follows on uh, clause by clause. And we've said it that often that we could even say it for, without thinking about it. Well, that, that is no use if that's how we pray. Uh, we have to pray with our thoughts and with our heart and mind and soul uh, engaged. And some pain, we can take the, what the, the petition is about and pray along those lines. And that's particularly what we want to think a little bit about uh, as we consider the Word of God at this present time. The very first petition there, or, or maybe we could uh, more accurately say the, the, the preface to the Lord's Prayer, is they are given, Our Father which art in heaven, our Father which art in heaven. And how good it is to be able to come to God in heaven as our Father. And when we start to think about what the Bible has to say about a Father and his pity and his compassion upon us, then how good and how encouraging it is to be able to come and to address the God of heaven as our Father. Not only to acknowledge him as God, for he is God, and that he is a great and a mighty God, but to be able to come to him as our Father, to come as children to a Father, to come to one whom we know is able and willing and ready to help us as we make our petition. There is that wonderful um, statement over in Psalm 103 that we could think about. It says, Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. And we're coming to one when we can come to this God in heaven as our Father. We're coming to one then who pities us, who looks down with compassion upon us, who sees us in all our need, who, who remembers that we are dust. He knoweth our frame. He made us. He's aware then of all of those things that we struggle with and the needs that we have, both in the physical sense and also in a spiritual sense as well. He understands our need. And he is able to come and he's able to meet our need. So how good it is to be able to address God in heaven as our Father and to come with these words. Now to do that, you have to be in the family of God. It's, it's children to a father here as to how we are to come. And if we are not the children of God, then how could we address him as our father? So we must come into his kingdom. We must come to know him as our God and our Savior. 
and be born of his spirit. We have to be born into this family. The Bible speaks about the spirit of adoption that we receive, that brings us into the family of God, because we're reminded there that we're not naturally of this family. There's not a single one of us by natural birth and natural descent as we come into this world belong to the family of God. We don't. We're of another family. The Lord Jesus told the Jews when he was teaching them at another occasion. We're of another family. We're not of his family. We have to be brought into this family through the spirit of adoption that we become count, uh, we're counted as members of this family through the work of his grace within us and saving us that we're born of his spirit that we have a new spiritual nature because God's family is a spiritual family. It's not a physical family. We are born into a physical family. But God's family is a spiritual family, and therefore we need a spiritual birth. We need a, a second birth. We need to be born again, as the Scripture uh, uses the terminology. So you have to come into God's family and be among his children, and then we can most certainly come to him as our Father, which art in heaven. And may we indeed be able to do so today, not just to address him as, as God in heaven, that would be good to be able to acknowledge that much. But to go further than that, to go a step further than that, and to be able to address him as our Father which art in heaven. I wonder, can you do that today? Can you say, I'm a child of the King. I belong to the family of God. That household of faith that the Bible speaks of. I'm one of the family members of this heavenly family, this divine family. I wonder today, can we say that? And if we can, then we most certainly can come and use this pattern prayer and take these words. He's God in heaven. Though, he's, though he is the God in heaven, our Father which is in heaven, yet he is interested in, in us on earth. He has mercy upon us. He looks down upon us. His eye runs to and fro through this world, we are told. And he sees us in our needs and may we indeed be able to address him as such. So that's the, the preface to the Lord's Prayer. I want you then, secondly, to think about the first petition that is here. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. That's showing a reverence and a respect for God. And praying that such would come to pass. That God's name would be hallowed. That greater reverence would be given to his name. And greater respect given to the things of God. Sadly, we live in a day when there's very little reverence for the things of God and very little respect for the things of God. And the Lord's name is often used as a curse word and a swear word, and it ought not to be. Well, that's, that's breaking one of the commandments, the third commandment, that tells us that we are not to take the name of the Lord our God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. But not only are we not to do that, but here's the positive. We're to actually seek and pray for the hallowing of his name. We're to give honor to God. The Bible tells us to give honor to whom it is due. And there are certain relationships we have in life that we give honor. <clears throat> the Bible tells us to honor our parents and to obey them and respect them and there's those relationships on earth and in earthly families that we give respect to and we honor individuals. But how much more are we to honor God? How much more does his name deserve to be hallowed, to be reverenced and respected? And may we indeed be those who, who live with a consciousness of God, a consciousness of his, his existence, a consciousness of his greatness, and who honor him as such, who live in such a way, and seek for the hallowing of his name. The thought is here of, of distinction being given, that God is different, God is set apart. He's worthy of our honor and our praise. He's, honor, he, he's worthy of us having the highest esteem for him, the highest esteem for him we ought to have. He, he's worthy of all of that. Everything that we consider about him, his nature and his ways, all lead us to that thought that here is someone who is to be honored. The highest honor it belongs on to God. 
And we are taught here to pray, pray to this end, pray that his name would be hallowed. So that, that, that refers to our own lives. We need to honor God in our own lives. And I, and I ask you that today. Do we honor God in our lives? Have we honored God in our lives? Have we given him his rightful place over the years? Have we given God his rightful place in our lives? Have we had any thought and regard for him and, and going about all the other things of life that, that come upon us, duties and responsibilities that we might have? Have we ever thought about giving God his rightful place, respecting and reverencing his name? Because his name stands for all that he is. A name identifies an individual. You and I have names. We have first names, second names, we have surnames. And those names are used to identify us. They mark us out as a certain individual. And we've got personality and, and character as a result of who we are. And the name, when you name somebody and call them by their name, we're, we're going to think about that. You're going to think about a particular person and, and the personality that is there and the character of that individual. Well, when the Bible uses the language like this, hallowed be thy name, and it uses names for God, it's giving God a certain character, certain personality. And we are to honor that name, honor that person, exalt the one who has these characteristics and personality traits. And may in our own lives we do that. And if we haven't, well, it's never too late to start. Now's the best time to do that. This very moment is even to bow our head and to acknowledge, Lord, I haven't given you the rightful place in my life that I ought to have, and I'm giving that to you now, and that he would have that honored place so we're to hallow his name. We're to show reverence and respect for God. And oh, that that would happen in this day and age in which we live. It would be better for us all. This is why we are to pray to this end. We're to pray that this would happen not only in our own lives, but in the lives of others. That others would come to reverence God and respect him for who he is. Respect his ways, respect his word, respect his law, respect his day, his commandments. Respect his son. We're, we're, we're to do all of these things. And may we indeed pray to that end. And may that come to pass. That that would come about in this day and age in which we live. I want you to think of one more petition here that is mentioned. Because not only is there the preface and then that first petition. But then the next petition is thy kingdom come. We're to pray for this. Thy kingdom come. The, the, the Bible speaks about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, one and the same. There's the kingdom of God. God has a kingdom. He is a king. He is a king. Our Lord and Savior is designated as king of kings and lord of lords. So God is indeed <coughs> a king. And he has a kingdom. And that kingdom is in the world. And that kingdom is being extended. And there's one day that kingdom is going to be seen in all its glory. That day is yet to come. And here we are taught that we have an interest in his kingdom. That we are not only interested in ourselves. We all have needs. Bodily needs, physical needs, emotional needs, mental needs. Certainly spiritual needs. We, we have many needs ourselves, but over and above that, we are to think about God's kingdom and his kingdom in this world and in this earth. And we are to pray for its advancement. So there is a king and there is a kingdom, and it's in this world at the present time. Oh, there's many who are opposed to, to the kingdom of God. Many who don't want to come and acknowledge the claims of Jesus Christ and yield to him humble themselves before him and take him as their Savior and Lord. Many don't want to do that, but those of us who do know him, those of us who have any regard for him, we're taught in this pattern prayer, here's something to pray for. Pray thy kingdom come, that God's kingdom will come. We want that kingdom to come in other people's lives. We want others to come to Christ and to know him, come to know what we have known. Taste and see that God is good, the psalmist said, 
And we want that for others. We want the very best for others. We can't, we can't seek anything better for them and that they would come into God's kingdom. Whether it's our family members or neighbors or friends or work colleagues, whoever, strangers around about us, we couldn't seek anything better for them than that they come into God's kingdom. That's the very best we could do for them. And therefore, we want that kingdom to come in their lives. We want God's kingdom to come in all its glory. And what a glorious day is coming when Jesus Christ will be seen as the king. He's coming again. He's coming again. He came the first time to accomplish redemption. That's why he went to the cross and laid down his life and died there. He came to accomplish redemption. He was the substitute and the sacrifice. But he's coming again. Oh, not, not in any humility, not in any condescension, not in any hidden way. He's coming in all his power and his glory. The Bible tells us that there's coming a day, and God alone knows when that day is. He has it marked on the divine calendar, and there's coming a day when the, the clouds are going to part, the heavens are going to be rolled together as a scroll, and Christ is going to appear. And we're going to see him. His kingdom is coming. And may we indeed be ready and make preparation for that day. What a glorious day that will be. All other kingdoms will be crushed and brought down. All the kingdoms of the world will come to an end. Some of them already have come to an end. Those kingdoms in, in past days and past centuries, even millennia ago, all those kingdoms have come to an end. But there is an everlasting kingdom, the Bible talks about, that knows no end. There's a king who's king forever. He's never going to be dethroned. He's never going to have to pass on his kingdom to another. He's an eternal king. And there's coming a day when his kingdom is coming. When I trust that you and I might be ready. How are we ready? We have to come and trust this king as our saviour. It's as simple as that. We have to come in simple childlike faith and believe on him to the saving of our souls. And then we will be ready. And then we can look forward there's another little verse I finish with. It's over in Isaiah's uh, prophecy. It says there about seeing the king in his beauty and seeing the land that is very far off. Are we going to see the king in his beauty? If the Lord tarries and our lives come to an end, are we going home to see him and meet him? Are we going to see the land very far off, that heavenly land, far beyond this world that is prepared for all those who know Christ. I trust we have this hope. So I trust the Lord will bless his word as we have considered just a few of these clauses and petitions that they're found in this wonderful pattern prayer that the Lord Jesus taught that day. May the Lord bless his word to all of our hearts. We're going to bow together in prayer and bring our service to a close. We thank you for listening. We appreciate you taking the time and doing so. And I trust the Lord will bless his word and the hymn singing and the, the scripture reading and this uh, little time we've spent considering the word. I th trust it'll be a blessing, even a challenge to you today. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father, we thank thee for the word of God. We thank thee for our Lord Jesus Christ, for his time here on earth during his first coming and all that he taught and all that he did. We bless thee most of all that he went to the cross and gave his life there as a ransom for the many, that we might be saved and have our sins forgiven. Do bless. Remember all who listen to this program and who are in the, the nursing homes, we pray that, Lord, you'll bless each one. Meet them at the very point of their need this day. And we pray that they might know the Lord as their portion, both in body and in soul. Abide with us now. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.